Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We're happy you could join us. My name is Naya Hyde and I'm the marketing assistant here at Brooks Publishing for the K-12 education products. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. You'll be muted for the webinar, but if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box. We'll take these questions after the presentation during the Q&A portion of the webinar. For the presentation, you might want to minimize the GoToWebinar bar on your monitor so you can see the of your screen. You can do that by clicking the orange button with the arrow in the top corner of the control bar. If you need to enlarge the bar again to ask a question, you can just click the orange button again. If you experience any audio issues at any point, you can switch to phone by clicking in the audio section of the webinar panel and using the dial-in information provided. Also, we are recording this webinar. Everyone who registered for the event will receive a link to the recording in the follow-up email tomorrow. During today's presentation, Rebecca McCauley will reference content from Interventions for Speech Sound Disorders in Children, the second edition. An essential building block of every speech language pathologist professional preparation, the second edition of this best-selling textbook is a comprehensive critical analysis of 21 interventions for highly prevalent speech sound disorders in children. Bringing together a powerhouse, powerhouse team of international experts, this new edition has been revised and enhanced with current research, new interventions, more guidance on selecting interventions and updated video clips that show the approaches in action. This book is a key graduate level text and an important professional resource for practicing SLPs, early interventionists and special educators. The book will help readers choose, the choose and use the best interventions for children with phonological or motor based speech disorders. I'm happy to announce that Brooks will also be giving away three copies of Interventions for Speech Sound Disorders in Children, the second edition. Winners will be randomly selected from today's live attendees and notified by email after the webinar. To increase your chances, be sure to submit your questions in the questions pane throughout the presentation. Also, we did want to mention at the end of the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete a survey. We would love to know what you thought of the webinar, and anyone who completes the survey will also be entered to win a copy of the book. <laughs> Everyone watching this webinar will be able to download a certificate of attendance. For those of you watching live, you may download your certificate from the handouts pane. Live attendees will also be emailed their certificate in the next 24 hours. And for those of you who are watching this webinar as a recording, stay tuned uh, to the end of today's presentation to learn how to access your certificate. Without further delay, I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Rebecca J. McCauley is a professor in the Department of Speech and Hearing Sciences at The Ohio State University. Her research and writing have focused on assessment and treatment of pediatric communication disorders, with special focus on speech sound disorders, including childhood apraxia of speech. She has authored or edited seven books on these topics and co-authored a test designed to aid in the differential diagnosis of childhood apraxia of speech. She's also a co-editor for the Brooks Communication and Language Series. Dr. McCauley is a fellow of the American Speech Language Hearing Association, has received honors of the association, and has served two terms as an associate editor of the American Journal of Speech Language Pathology. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. And let me um, just hope that everybody has their uh, afternoon beverage, um, since this is a coffee chat. <clears throat> and I'll see if I can get my afternoon voice going here for you. So, um, at the end of our brief time together today, um, I'm hopeful that you will be able to describe core features of childhood apraxia of speech that will be targeted by the different interventions I'll be discussing, list specific groups for which each intervention may be best suited, summarize the kinds of evidence being used to support these interventions and identify key resources to help you learn more about each of the interventions. Now this set of rings probably looks pretty familiar to you in terms of what we consider when we make an evidence-based choice of an intervention. I'm using them a little bit differently here because in fact I think that as we make an evidence-based choice we need to consider child characteristics. Now, usually in this place, you would hear about the individual being served, their preferences, their cultural background, et cetera. Here, I'm suggesting you need to consider what speech sound disorder subtype the child has been diagnosed with, 
what other conditions do they have? Because perhaps they have conditions that are going to make certain kinds of interventions less feasible for them. You need to consider their age, their level of functioning, and so on. Here, for this ring, where you usually see something like external evidence, I'm saying we need to consider the external evidence, but we need to consider characteristics of the intervention that are broader than that. We need to consider its practical fit with your context and with the child's context to see, does it seem likely to work in that context? For example, currently we're all dealing with the COVID crisis. In this context, could you imagine using this intervention over telepractice? I'm not going to uh, talk about that directly, but I think that's something that may come to mind as we look at videos associated with each of these four interventions I'll be talking about. Now, the third thing to consider is the clinician characteristics. And usually in this place, in an evidence-based kind of uh, graphic, you would expect to see something about your clinical expertise. Well, I think in addition to clinical expertise, you need to appreciate what is your experience with this population, what is your experience with a given intervention already? How much training would you need? So my hope is that as we go through, look at videos, I give you a bit of information about each of these four interventions, you'll be able to get a sense of which you want to explore further. <coughs> In addition, I'm hopeful that the um, resources in the handout that I've given you will also allow you to go out and get some further information. So in summary, your best choice has to be a, a choice that takes into consideration all these different characteristics. Now, what are the core features that are going to be addressed in these interventions? And I apologize for some reason, I've got a tickle in my throat. Don't know if I'm a little nervous. <coughs> I don't think so, but anyways, I'm excited to talk to you. So what is the underlying source of impairment in childhood apraxia? We believe that it's planning and programming of movements for speech. Uh, that the child is having difficulty, maybe they know what they want to say, but it's getting the muscles and the muscular system to work in a coordinated fashion that they're having trouble planning. Subsequently, they end up with challenges in phonologic development and later in literacy. So in fact, I want to call your attention to another intervention I'm not really going to spend much time on today called phonological awareness intervention that's been developed and is described in the textbook that we've been talking about by McNeil and Gillen that relates to this and is specific to children with childhood apraxia of speech. They've developed interventions more broadly for kids with speech sound disorders, and to some extent the intervention could be used for them, but it's also been used in a modified form for kids with CAS. The discriminative symptoms that are often what are gonna be targeted in particularly the interventions I'll talk about today are Inconsistent errors on consonants and vowels in repeated production of syllables or words. Lengthened, disrupted coarticulatory transitions between individual sounds and across syllables. And inappropriate prosody, especially in the realization of lexical or phrasal stress. Now notice this last characteristic is really pretty particular to stress languages, not all languages use uh, phrasal stress. We suspect that there are prosodic abnormalities in other languages as well, um, but more uh, description of that needs to be undertaken. Okay, so here are the four interventions, each of which is described in a chapter in this upcoming textbook. Dynamic temporal and tactile cueing, the Nuffield Center Dyspraxia Program, this is a British program, hence the use of the word dyspraxia as opposed to childhood apraxia of speech. Prompt and speech motor programming intervention. And you'll come to see that there are actually two interventions that fit within this umbrella. First of all, dynamic temporal and tactile cueing has been developed by Edith Strand, who spent much of her career at the Mayo Clinic. 
the population that she's designed this for is for children with severe childhood apraxia. And she's also used this with children who have neurodevelopmental disabilities. Now, while most of the interventions I'm talking about today can be used with children who have a number of different disorders in addition to childhood apraxia of speech, not all of them have, so I thought I would point that out. What are the key areas being addressed? Motor learning, and that's going to be a common theme you'll see across the interventions. We've learned a lot about how individuals uh, plan movement from people outside our field, and this has begun to be applied within our field to see how best we can help people with motor speech problems. So specific uh, goals will be smooth movement between sounds and syllables, accurate and consistent movement plans for vowels and consonants, and appropriate prosodic, prosodic patterns. Both stress, but other prosodic patterns like intonation. You'll notice in the video that we see that the little boy does have problem with stress, but he also has this kind of repetitive intonation pattern that we want to make sure doesn't become typical of his spontaneous productions. The methods that are used are the following, um, and this is again common within the motor speech literature. Pre-practice and then practice, where pre-practice is doing everything that can be done to help the child produce a word consistently and accurately. And this is often done for a very small set of functional words comprised of consonant vowels or consonant vowel consonants in children that this has been used with most often. It also makes use of an imitation hierarchy so that sometimes the clinician simultaneously produces a, a word with the child after having provided one auditory uh, uh, model. She may mime the word with the child as the child makes an attempt at an imitation. She may ask for an immediate imitation or a delayed imitation in which she sort of cautions the child to wait until she points at it. And it's really interesting to see how that can pose a problem to some children, including, I believe, the little boy that we're going to see today. Now, the evidence supporting this intervention consists of a systematic review. And you may remember that systematic reviews are at the top of the heap because they're a review, but they're conducted in a way that tries to be as comprehensive and transparent as possible. It looks at all the research that's been done up to that point in time. So in that systematic review, Murray and her colleagues identified uh, DTTC, for short, Dynamic Temporal and Tactile Cueing, among three of the most promising. There's another one that we'll talk about today that also is on that list, and the one I've already mentioned for phonological awareness was the third on their list. Now, in terms of resources that uh, are listed in your handout and, and go further than this brief, brief, brief introduction are the chapter, but also video materials through Mayo Clinic. You can just do a little Googling uh, and type in Edie Strand's, Edie Strand's name, type childhood practice of speech and video, and you'll almost certainly fall into these. Also, there's a website that I'm, I've given you on the handout. Once Upon a Time Foundation has provided some videos of Edie, but also helps support some workshops for people who want to learn more about it. Now, because of time, I'm only going to be able to show you three minutes or about three minutes of each of the videos we have. Um, this, act, this video actually is one that Edie has given me earlier in our acquaintance friendship, and I will play that here. She didn't include videos for this version of the book. This is the first one, the first edition that includes her intervention. We we're thrilled to get it, but that's because so much material is available already that she she thought that you, you will be able to find it. So let's, let's take a listen. Please notice that the dynamic nature of this intervention lies in the fact 
that this level of support that she's giving for cueing and the variety of cues that she uses, and also in the kinds of imitation she's demanding is meant to kind of slide up and down to be easier and harder as he's able to be successful. Thank you very much. If you Good. I'll do it, then you do it. Hi, Mom. Hey. Hey. Not Hi. Hey. Hey. Mom. Hey. Good. Let's do it again. Together. Hi. Oh, you have to move that jaw, sweetie. Remember? Hi. Let's do both parts of that. Hi. Hey. Good one. Hi. Hi. Because we end up with an E going. Hi. Good. Three times. Hi. Hi. Good one. Hi. Good. Now we'll do I'm on. Hi. Good job. Um. Rebecca, it looks like that worked for people. So I think everyone was able to hear the audio that time. Okay, well, let me just, I somehow think I turned it off. Um, let's see if I can't get it going back again. And I'll move this a little bit further. Good, excellent. But let's do it slower so you can do the whole sound. I, try I, let's do it slow. Hi, good one. Hi. Good. Now I'll do it and then you do it. Hi, Mom. Hey, good. Good job. Let's do that three times. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Hey, good. Good job. Who brought you here today? Uh, sorry, our, our, uh, I'm going to move it ahead a little bit so that we can catch up. Oops. I am so sorry. Um, oh, you're going to say my about it this time. We can just say bye for a while. Bye. Bye. You have a red. Bye. Good. I'm 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 good. Good job. Now I have the delay. I'm good. Oh, my turn. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay, I'm stopping it there so that um, we've, we'll have enough time to watch the other videos that are coming up that indeed uh, the, um, some, of the, some of the features you saw, her adding in the delay, notice that she was also varying her prosody a lot as she got further into her intervention with him. And the intent of that was to help him develop a more normal intonation pattern and uh, to have the stress be accurate. Sometimes uh, children with this problem have uh, equal excessive stress and a kind of a sing-songy type production of speech and we want to avoid that. Now the next intervention is the Nuffield Center Dyspraxia Program, sometimes called MDP3 because they have the third edition of their manual for the Nuffield Dyspraxia Program. It's a, meant for population uh, pretty broad between three and 12 years with mild to severe CAS and other speech sound disorders. It's been used for that as well. And for children with other developmental problems. Now they do note the children with autism spectrum disorder and uh, with without the necessary symbolic skills and potential for linguistic development, 
such as word blending, may have some challenges with the intervention. Now, they are the only group that mentions motor and linguistic learning as a goal, and they work through a hierarchy uh, from first working on individual sounds to sound sequence into simple, then complex words, and they always use words of high frequency. Ultimately, they work towards larger units of speech production, and all the while, they want the child to be maintaining segmental and prosodic accuracy through phrases and sentences. Methods used here are pre-practice, so unlike the other interventions, this intervention, as it's currently constructed, just considers a bringing out all the bells and whistles to support the child in each and every production. So that's why it's called pre-practice rather than having a practice component, although that's something they're thinking of adding in the future. So this consists of using modeling, verbal cues, visual tactile cues, pictures, diagrams, and they provide knowledge of results, meaning correct or incorrect, and knowledge of performance, oh, you did this, you needed to do this with your tongue to have it sound just like I said it. It uses pictures of targeted stimuli, so it has a great many pictures that are associated with the intervention and are available in that um, manual that they have, but I, also available through a program you can use. The tasks include sound discrimination, imitation, sorting by onset and rhyme, and word segmenting and blending. So it includes some phonological awareness activities as a part of the intervention. Hence, this idea that they're getting into linguistic aspects of speech production, not just kind of focusing on the motor speech aspects. So far, they have three studies that are published and seven others that are described in the treatment manual. Now, this was another intervention that has been studied, sorry, it, it wasn't in the systematic review, but it was just, uh, studied in a systematic, uh, sorry, randomized control trial where it was pitted against another intervention we're gonna talk about rest. This intervention had a bigger effect, uh, treatment effect uh, than uh, NEF, the, then REST did the other intervention it was compared to. However, both were considered excellent uh, and, and maintenance was better for REST. So they have a, a second randomized control trial that's currently in progress and they're looking at whether or not they should provide this practice phase. Resources include the chapter in the new textbook, they have their own website, manual, and software. So let's take a look at a little bit of this intervention with Pam Williams introducing this to us. My name's Pam Williams and I'm going to introduce you to a short demonstration of a treatment session using the therapeutic principles and materials of the Nuffield Centre Dyspraxia Programme. This therapy approach was designed to address the speech sound voice and prosodic difficulties of children with childhood apraxia of speech. It focuses on building accurate speech motor programs starting from single consonant and vowel sounds and simple syllables and gradually progresses to more complex words, sentences and eventually connected speech. We recommend a multi-level, multi-target treatment approach with a number of different targets being worked on simultaneously at different levels of speech production. In this demonstration, Sally, aged seven years, is working with her speech and language therapist, Frances Ridgway. First, they do an activity to work on the accuracy of Sally's vowels in isolation, supported by the Nuffield picture symbols and diagrammatic mouth shapes. This is the sound that you were just telling me and it's got a really nice wide mouth like a smile and you did that really nicely. So this little mouse, picture of a mouse, and what's the sound that we make for the mouse? E. Very good. Hand down. Do you remember what I said about we're going to take a big breath and we're going to try and do a long E. We're going to go all the way around. E. Brilliant. 
brilliant well done gosh you're excellent at that one so here we've got a teddy picture and he's thinking very hard and he's saying uh uh great so take a big breath and show me how good you are okay that was very good but i think it wasn't as good as the e Take a big breath and remember to try and keep your mouth in the shape all the way through, okay? Uh... Well done. You really kept your mouth in the shape there and that really made a difference. Now Sally is asked to try and maintain both accuracy of consonants and vowels in short words involving one consonant and one vowel sound. So I'm going to say the word that's outside, then we're going to say the one in the middle. So we're going to kind of jump. So I'm going to go tha pair, so pair. It's quite hard. Th pair. You start from here. Coffee pair, shoe pair, go pair, door pair, no pair. Far pair, so pair, fur pair, tea one. pair. Well done. Okay, we need to stop there. I'm afraid to give a fair shake to the My other programs I'm going to discuss. Uh, and let's move on to talking about prompt. Prompt is rarely described as anything but prompt, but it stands for Prompts for Restructuring Oral Muscular Phonetic Targets. And it's been developed over many years by Deb Hayden and her colleagues. The population that it's been used for is very broad, the broadest of any of the interventions I'm talking about. It's been used from two-year-olds, even perhaps 18-year-olds they mention, to adults, sorry, 18-month-olds, to adults who have sensory, motor, and phonological impairments, including CAS and other speech sound disorders. This wide range of uh, uh, individuals they've served include children with uh, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, developmental dysarthria, and autism spectrum disorder. And in fact, they have research that talks about these the use of this intervention with those groups. Now, this uh, approach uses a model for thinking about the development of motor control. That's a, a, a stage model where there are seven stages. We're initially just controlling muscle tone for the musculature used in speech production then phonatory control, then mandibular control, labial facial control, lingual control, sequenced movement, and finally prosody. So this uses uh, and describes itself as using fun activities with functional goals. I'm, I'm letting you read what those are. And having objectives that are both physical, sensory, and cognitive linguistic. So on the surface, it could look as if it's really just focused on uh, motor activity, but the authors have done a lot to try to develop it, so that's not, they don't consider that true. It uses several different kinds of auditory tactual input that are called PROMs, and each of these relates to a different aspect of motor learning. This is in some ways the most complex intervention to read about, it's one of the most uh, long-standing in terms of use, and it uses both masked and distributed practice, where distributed practice is, you know, practice a little bit here, practice a little bit there, and masked is, we're just gonna practice the same word, the same set of stimuli in, for long periods of time. Now, the prompts are the most noticeable thing about this intervention when we look at it. It involves touching the face and uh, neck, of the uh, individual that is receiving the prompting. And uh, so in some ways, I think it kind of will strike us as particularly jarring almost in days where telepractice is becoming more and more common. And certainly where we're very worried about contagion because in fact, uh, although I think they uh, respect hygienic practices, the clinician is not wearing gloves during this the video that we'll see. The evidence, uh, they have nine studies, and the strongest one by far are two uh, peer-reviewed published controlled studies that don't use randomization. So that's kind of 
down from the other venture, uh, interventions we've talked about. However, uh, there is a report on their website that in fact they have a newly published randomized control trial, which is right up there almost at the systematic review level. Resources include the, ch the chapter with a video in the textbook and also a website with information about trainings and access to online training materials. I said training manuals, but in fact, they have an online set of trainings that are available. So let's look at three minutes of this intervention starting now. Hi, I'm Jennifer Eigen. I'm a speech pathologist and a certified prompt instructor. Prompt is mostly known as an approach in which the clinician uses their hands for tactile, kinesthetic, proprioceptive input to help the client's articulators move efficiently. Prompt systematically identifies motor breakdowns based on how the child moves when producing speech to identify three priorities on the motor speech hierarchy. In this case, the three priorities are lingual, labial facial, and mandibular control. This approach acknowledges how the articulators dynamically interact, recognizing that improvements in jaw control result in improved control of the lips and tongue. Prompt approaches communication as an interaction of the physical sensory, cognitive linguistic, and social emotional domains within the conceptual framework. All aspects of the child are considered and addressed, not solely speech production. In this video, the child's reasoning and conceptual language skills are targeted to support the cognitive linguistic domain. Support is provided in the social emotional domain to improve task persistence. You will observe the prompt technique. Four levels are systematically adjusted based on the child's performance following each production to ensure accuracy and motor learning. Fading the amount of tactile, kinesthetic, proprioceptive support is critical in the prompt approach as independent and accurate motor control is the ultimate goal. It's right there. Do you feel that? Good, letting your ear out. So let's do C together. C. Open and close one more time. C. Goes. Goes. Good, and let's try and find that Z. Ooh, no wiggle. Let's use our tongue, not our jaw. Z. Oh, that was it. Z. I'm so proud of you. Feel it here. Open and close. One more time. Ready mouth. That's not your ready mouth. Let me see your ready mouth. <gasps> Good for you. Z is right here with that tongue. Z. Good. So try goes. Goes. You try. Open your mouth or go. Goes. Watch me say that you put it in. Yeah, let's feel our tongue working when we say put it in. In. Yeah, you can open and close a little. Watch me. Put, Put it, it in. in. Yeah, you can help by yourself. You're such a good helper. Put, Put it in. in. Do you need? Okay, I'm going to stop it here. Um, as I said, I had to show just a part of each of these videos in order to try to fit it uh, within a reasonable amount of time. So, <clears throat> Speech motor programming is the intervention, is the, the last of the interventions I'll talk about. And it comes under two names, uh, TEMPO, which stands for Treatment for Establishment of Motor Program Organization. And it's also known as REST, Rapid Syllable Transition Treatment. This intervention came to have two names because undoubtedly of some complexities I certainly don't know about in the development teams because Kiri Ballard, who is the author, co-author of the chapter and her former dissertation advisor, were certainly involved at the very beginning, but the rest intervention has been uh, developed sometimes with Kiri and uh, very often with uh, an individual at the University of Sydney whose name, is, a professor whose name is uh, Patricia McCabe. The population this is meant for and has been studied in is four to 12 with some functional speech. Now this is the intervention that's pretty different because it doesn't, they recommend that you don't use this with children who have another uh, neurodevelopmental diagnosis. So no cognitive impairment, no autism and normal receptive language. Um, once you see the stimuli that are used, you'll appreciate that this 
is probably, uh, I think, for children who are a little more advanced in their speech development than some of the other interventions. Key areas being addressed are motor learning, so articulatory accuracy, lexical stress across syllables, and fluency of transitions between syllables is a focus. Methods that are used pre-practice is used to uh, in which the child is told that they need to say all the sounds in a word, they need to be smooth, and then they need to use stress. And during that pre-practice phase, they're given lots of immediate feedback and cueing. In practice, however, multisyllabic, or as they say in Australia, uh, polysyllabic nonsense words are used, presented in a random order. There's variability of presentation, delayed imitation, and delayed feedback. So knowledge of results is, excuse me, often gives, given three to five seconds after the child has made an attempt and not after every single trial where the child makes an attempt. The evidence for this is seven studies. These have primarily been done on the version of this intervention called REST. The strongest actually is REST uh, of the two interventions, which I've said are very, very similar to one another. And that was the uh, systematic review that chose this as one of the three best interventions out there for CAS. And there is also that randomized control trial in which REST was uh, compared against the Nuffield approach that we've talked about. Okay, uh, the resources available for it are with the chapter in the new book and also on the REST website, which I've given you in the handout, and that's connected with the University of Sydney. Okay, let's take a look at this. And this, they have a slightly longer video, so that means we're not going to see as much of practice as I would have liked. I'll try to see what I can do about that. Treatment for Establishment of Motor Program Organization, or TEMPO, was designed specifically to address the three core features of childhood apraxia of speech. These features are articulatory accuracy, lexical stress across syllables, reflected by differences in syllable duration, pitch, and loudness, and reducing syllable segmentation by decreasing the time between syllables and the length of vowels and consonants. Tempo focuses at the level of polysyllabic pseudo-words and adheres to principles of motor learning. In principles of motor learning, there are two key components to a therapy session, pre-practice, and practice. The first video segment will show the clinician doing pre-practice where traditional speech therapy is done. The clinician guides the child through supported attempts at producing the target behaviors, explaining the features of a correct versus incorrect word production, providing models for imitation if needed, providing cues that help to shape more accurate attempts, and detailed feedback on how the production was correct or incorrect, along with suggestions for how to improve accuracy. All right, so now we're gonna practice saying some nonsense words, just like we did the last time you were here, okay? So that means I want you to say them exactly the way I say them. Can you tell me the three things you were supposed to include? I mean, sounds, mm -hmm. stress, smoothness. Very good. So sounds means I want you to say all the same sounds I do. Can you tell me what smoothness means? It means put, putting all my words together. That's right. All the sounds, taking them and pushing them together. All right. And for stress, that means that some words are going to be stronger in the beginning, like dinosaur, or in the middle, like banana. Okay? Think you're ready to start? Yes. All right. Let's get started. Taguba. Taguba. Good. I heard all your sound, stress, and smoothness. Let's try another one. Tugaby. Tugaby. All right, close. Now these sounds got mixed around. All right, let's try it again. Tuga. Tuga. Tugaby. Tugaby. Nice job. That was all the sounds and stress. Let's see if we can push them together now. Tugaby. Tugaby. Oh, I heard those get switched around again. Let's try it one more time. Tuga. 
Tuga. Tuga B. Tuga B. Great. Nice job pushing those together and getting all the sounds in order and that stress. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move this up so that, in fact, we can see an example of practice. You'll still have to say each word this, exactly the way I say it, with the same sounds, stress, and smoothness. But this time, I won't always tell you if you're right or if you're wrong. And if you're wrong, I might not help you fix it, okay? Listen carefully to what I say and to what you say. And think about the sounds, stress, and smoothness that you're using. Do you have any questions? No. Awesome. Okay, let's get started. Tuguba. Tuguba. Oh, so oh. remember, wait until I point. That's how I Tuguba. Tuguba. All right. Good, good. Work on. Tugabi. Tugabi. Work on. Good. Work on. Batigu. Batigu. The hope is that you've gotten a chance to kind of get a bit of an overview of these interventions. I've added a few more practical details to the handout that you have in front of you. The need is for evidence-based practice choices continues to consist of your being able to choose an intervention that's gonna work for the child and the child's needs. It's gonna have some evidential support and it's gonna fit in your environment and indeed, uh, um, in using it is going to be acceptable to you. You are going to be able to learn that easily enough or with effort, but you have the ability to take the time to put in that effort so that you can administer the intervention with fidelity and thereby will be able to, in fact, feel quite comfortable about your likelihood of achieving the uh, results that were achieved in the studies that were providing the evidence that the intervention does what it's supposed to do. Thanks so much for such a great presentation, Rebecca. Um, we really appreciate you sharing all this information with us and spending your time with us today. I want to just remind everyone to be sure to reference um, the provided handout for a quick chart highlighting details and references from today's presentations and the videos. We did get a lot of great questions today, so we're going to head right into the questions portion of our webinar. Um, one of the first questions that we got today was, what advice would you give for implementing these interventions in the schools, taking into consideration time constraints and high caseload? Uh, that's going to be a huge challenge. Um, I don't. I haven't had experience working with these in the schools, but I think the once they're learned, that uh, and, and once you look into some of the details of them. Um, I think that if you look at the scheduling plan, I believe it's the um, uh, one of the interventions really is something that you could use block scheduling. So you saw the child for a period of time, you might see them more intensely, and then you would have them off your caseload. So that if you can schedule like that, you might be able to do it. Also, if you could bring in a child for relatively short periods of time, I do think that most of the interventions would allow for that. Um, I has, have said that I think right now, the, uh, the, uh, that I see problems with using prompt, even if you do have gloves on, I, I think the proximity might be problematic, but I would go to their website and see if they don't have recommendation, recommendations, if indeed that approach seems to appeal to you. Um, as I've said, the, each of these, there are, there are web materials for each of these that really will let you explore them a little more. And as I said, there's a lot more information in the chapters that they've uh, shared for this upcoming uh, Brooks book. I hope that answered the question. Yes, awesome. Great plug to the book, too. Um, what are your recommendations for young children who have difficulty attending to teletherapy sessions? 
Yeah, that's going to be challenging to get kids to attend to therapy sessions. I think the closer you can have, you know, the the kind of the closer they can see your face, the closer you can see their face, you want them for, I think, any of these interventions. If you're talking about a child who's very severe, you will want them to be able to play a close attention to your mouth. Now, it doesn't matter if they've got aversion to making eye contact, just you can either for cultural reasons or because they're on the spectrum, having them attend to your mouth and using reinforcers like something that you can display that might be fun or working with someone in their environment to give them some very quick reinforcers so that you can get a lot of responses in, I think it's gonna be valuable for any of these uh, interventions. Awesome, another great response. Um, have you found that some children get discouraged easily, especially when you try to work on articulation? Well, absolutely. The kids with childhood apraxia of speech are gonna be prime candidates for getting burned out, absolutely burned out. And that's why each of the interventions in its own way is trying to take that into account. I, I frankly, in my opinion, the last two interventions, tempo, rest, I think that's one that may pose the greatest difficulty for children. And that's why I'm thinking I would recommend it for a child who's really kind of resolving their childhood apraxia, speech issues, motor planning issues, and now are looking more phonologically impaired. <coughs> uh, nonetheless, it's been used with that population and found to be helpful. I just think those interventions where you're using more of a developmental approach, which is really the case for Nuffield, and somewhat the case for the intervention uh, PTTC uh, and, and prompt, because the examples I gave you for prompt were pretty high level performing uh, children, that if you use those approaches where you're really hoping for success and you're gonna reward success and you're gonna wanna see success, uh, you're gonna be less likely to frustrate the child and more keep them going with you. Uh, another kind of, uh, I mean, this is obvious to any clinician perhaps, but in something I'd seen Edie present lately, she indicated that, you know, making sure that you're building that relationship with the child so that in, you take a break when you need to and talk about something personal in the child's life to kind of bring them back into relationship with you and away from the focus on, this is something I have a hard time doing. It's like, you know, any of us who have a skill that's not terribly well developed, I always think about the times I've been coached for uh, sports activities. I'm terrible, I'm a disaster. You know, I was the last one picked on teams, but uh, finding ways for uh, people to reflect on, you know, their involvement with you can really help you turn away from the fact that what they're asking you to do is just really, really, really hard. Again, I hope that answers that question at least a small amount. No, yeah, that's a great response. Um, another question we got was, would you treat young children with these treatments regardless of whether they have a phonological delay disorder or CAS before you know the diagnosis? Well, I think you, uh, I think what you'll find is that these interventions well, several of them have been developed really not necessarily for uh, childhood apraxia of speech. In, in particular, Nuffield and the, um, the uh, prompt approach sort of indicate that they can be used for kids with a whole lot of different diagnoses. But my impression is that what you'll see is just amazingly rapid progress if the child has a phonological impairment. This is for children who, uh, that you know, it used to be one of the things that people would talk about is distinctive for this group of children was their slow response to conventional interventions. So I would primarily turn to this. If you have phonological interventions that you already like and use, you might uh, trial those, trial those to see if they can be helpful. And then if they can't, then turn, devote the time needed to help those relatively smaller group of children who are just needing to make very slow but important progress. 
because even children that I know uh, Edie Strand has seen who have very, very little speech will often end up being talkers and at some point will not need that intervention anymore and will instead kind of graduate to more phonologically uh, oriented interventions. Another also, question? Great response. I think we'll ask one more question. Um, do you have a recommendation for the best frequency and dosage for these interventions? Well, the, the, what is typically thought to be the case is kind of high dosage, meaning, um, you know, a lot of responses per time that the child is met. Depending on the child's attention skills, I would look at what each of the interventions recommends for kind of the duration of sessions and uh, how frequently they occur. Um, they're, they're pretty distinctive in, in what they recommend and they know, they know better than I make a recommendation. Um, I think in general, uh, people in the apraxia, childhood apraxia of speech world say, you know, it might be bad to get a child in yeah, 15 minutes at the beginning of the school day, 15 minutes towards the end. I know it's a nightmare to try to schedule, but that kind of distributed practice is going to work better than if you just had one hour a week that you could focus on that child. Now, that said, I think some of the interventions that I've introduced to you today don't necessarily ascribe to that viewpoint. Um, and you should look at some of the details. I think that last table may have some details like that. And certainly the websites that you go to for each of these would certainly, we ask them to discuss that kind of feature in their chapters that they did for us for the uh, Interventions for Speech Sound Disorders in Children book. Awesome. Um, Rebecca, thank you so much. That was a great response. Rebecca, thank you for um, all of those great responses that you were able to provide. And again, thank you everyone for sharing your questions. Um, we really appreciate everyone spending their time with us today. We're going to head over to our next slide. So everyone watching this webinar, um, you'll be able to download a certificate of attendance. Um, everyone watching live, you can now download your certificate from the handouts pane. And live attendees, you will also be emailed your certificate in the next 24 hours. Just a quick reminder that you will be prompted to complete a survey at the conclusion of the presentation. We would love to know what you thought of today's webinar and anyone who completes the survey will be entered to win a free copy of Interventions for Speech Sound Disorders in Children, the second edition. I'd also like to remind everyone that we are offering a 20% off discount on our products, including Interventions for Speech Sound Disorders in Children, the second edition to the end of January. Anyone who watches this webinar or the recording can use the code COFFEECHAT at checkout to receive the discount. If you're looking for more professional development webinar opportunities over the coming weeks, be sure to visit the Brooks Publishing website for the latest additions to our Coffee Chat series. We're hosting chats every Wednesday with our esteemed authors, and we would love for you to join us. And for additional support, visit the link on your screen. On this page, you'll find a collection of recommended reading, downloadable resources, and professional development webinars from Brooks and leading organizations. And just one last reminder for everyone watching live, you can download your certificate from the handouts pane. You'll also be emailed your certificate in the next 24 hours. And for those of you who are watching this webinar as recording, please follow the link on your screen to access your certificate of attendance. Again, thank you to everyone who attended. We do apologize for all the technical difficulties today, but Rebecca, your presentation was amazing. Um, and we hope to see all of you guys again soon. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all so much. Bye.